Yo, how's it going? So, in less than two weeks from now, it's actually going to be hitting my one year anniversary of starting film photography. So I think on the 31st of December was when I purchased my first film camera, which is actually this one here, the Canon AE1. And over that year, I've learned, like, Jesus, the most I've ever learned about photography. I've learned how to manually shoot. I've learned how to develop my own film. I've learned all of the technical details, not all of them, a lot of them. And yeah, I've built up quite a collection of cameras over that time. I've been you know, obsessed with it. I've shot tons and tons and tons and tons of rolls of film. But recently I've put a new investment into a new camera because I have a lot of mechanical cameras. I use things like the Olympus Trip and Canon A1. But I wanted something that could take my Nikon lenses, but was also sort of a hybrid between electronic and, you know, like... So what I invested in was this little beauty here, which is the Nikon F100. What seems to me is like a last effort of throwing all the technology that had been built up over decades of, uh, you know, using film, it's kind of seemed to be chucked into this camera, the Nikon F100. So you had the Nikon F5 which was out at the time but it was a much bulky camera, it had a battery grip extra part that made it but that much taller than the F100. So from a purely standpoint of how compact and when it features and the frame that it could fire, it was super super advanced. Now digital cameras had a lot of cool features but this thing for being filmed kind of packed in as much as it could and fought digital head on. Um, a lot of features that were in this were the beginning of things that would carry on to much more advanced DSLRs and what features that we still have nowadays. So on the back obviously you can see there's no display, so anything you want to, ch settings you change, you can't like look at a little display. But this obviously up here, this little LCD panel is a display and it can hold information. It was very limited the information it could hold, but to get around this, Nikon implemented a custom menu function button. So what this did was when you held it, it brought up a number here, um, which is basically like a menu listing. So each number has a different um, a different feature listed to that. So say for example, I don't, I can't remember all the numbers off by heart, but say for example, three was to do with um, if there's a delay on clicking the shutter or something. So one is yes and zero is no, that sort of thing. I don't remember many of the function numbers because the only way you can know is really to look at the manual and try and remember all the numbers. And I've only had it a couple of weeks, so you know I don't really remember all the numbers. One that I do remember that everybody should use and always leave it on is 16. So 16 is the timer function. So it's the delay between if you have it on timer um, and you click the shutter, the delay between how long it is from clicking to firing. So for me just now it's on two seconds. So if I was to click this now, it'd be two seconds and then fire like that. But then I could change that to five seconds, 10 seconds or 20 seconds. So that's a super, super useful feature. Especially, you know, if you're doing a self portrait or if you're doing a landscape or what I found was shooting over Christmas, I set my camera up on a tripod, I had some slide film in here and then clicked that, you know, I clicked 10 seconds, ran away, with my family, ran next to them, and then this thing's flashing. Look, and then, awesome. Super useful feature. Now, obviously this is very simplistic, but at the time it was really awesome having all these features and all this customizability that we take for granted now. And the fact that this then carried on to mature into a proper, you know, like LCD panel at the back that you could go through with the buttons, D-pad, is really awesome to see, you know, how it really began. Some other features that it has are it has an autofocus on button. So yeah, using the autofocus on button, it autofocuses the camera. So usually, you know, you'd half press the shutter to autofocus and full to click. But if you don't want to risk taking a shot, you have this autofocus button. Really, really cool. Um, you have some other things as well. So this is the D-pad, which is the one of the most comfortable D-pads I've used. It just sits so naturally. I have quite big hands, but it just sits exactly where my thumb lies, and it lets you choose the autofocus point. So inside of here, there is five separate autofocus points. Doesn't seem like a lot from today's standard, but it's all you really need, and I get by just fine with it. So when you're looking through the viewfinder, it has one in the middle, you know, one up top and bottom, left and right. 
you click D-pad when you're half clicking the shutter for focus and you can just select where you would like it to focus. And then you can either have it continuously focus on there on just when it's focused, it stays locked. Super nice, super useful. And then also if this, if you find this is too easy to click, you have a lock button and it just doesn't allow you to click it. Now, I think that that for 19.99 and film camera is insane, especially coming from something like, let me see, let's just grab it quickly. The Canon AE-1, which has been my primary film camera for the past you know, year, it's a lot more classic SLR, you know. It's got a self timer, it does, but it's, it's not as complex as that. It's one set and it's 10 seconds, you can't change it. Um, it's, it's cool to see sort of the progression, you know, this is 1976, this is 1999, so 20 years from this was like a big, big seller. But, you know, this is more of a pro camera, but still the progression from this to this is awesome. Yeah, and just in terms of actual, like the quality of the build, like the build quality of it, and the way it holds, it's awesome. Like it's weighty, it's a magnesium alloy body, but it just feels like so good in the hand. Compared to the camera I'm filming this on, which is a Nikon D5300, which is like, you know, uh, like a consumer camera and nowadays, the D5300 is very plasticky and lightweight and it just, it's decent build quality for today, but this thing is just, they don't make cameras like this anymore because why would they? You know, they can just cheap out and make cheaper feeling ones, but this just feels so nice. It just has that classic Nikon look, which I just love the look of. It has bracketing built in. So if you're wanting, if you're shooting, say for example, slide film, so I've got some here, like some Velvia 50. If you were to shoot this, you have to get exposures pretty dead on the slide film, which can be a problem because, you know, there's sometimes usually dynamic scenes that don't allow that you, you can struggle to know exactly what your exposure should be. So bracketing's cool because it can let you shoot three frames or two frames. If you're shooting three frames, it lets you shoot the one that you would have exposed at, one stop less and lower and one stop higher. So you can have three different frames ensuring that probably one of them is exposed properly. Or you could sort of do some, you know, darkroom stuff and try and overlap the frames. Um, but that's, that's, that's really nice to have. Something that's definitely very 1999 is the batteries this thing takes. Now look at this, four AA batteries. It, it's fairly good on battery life to be honest. It doesn't eat them up too quickly, but you know, I, batteries aren't exactly ideal. Uh, especially just how bad they are to the environment. So rechargeables are definitely like advised there. This thing just, in terms of 35mm, I don't really think you need anything more than this. Of course, it's all about your chemistry with the camera, if it allows you to get shots or not. Because 35mm, some people view it as a very limited, a limited photographic tool because you know it doesn't have as much detail as medium format and some digital cameras have more detail it's more about the look and just the experience of film when you're shooting 35 mil this camera for me has an amazing um, balance of you know chemistry and just feeling comfortable shooting and getting the shots that I want it's a super dope camera I would recommend anyone to get it especially if you've got Nikon glass you just you have to invest in it if you own Nikon glass there's no questions about getting it because you're able to autofocus, you're able to get the full, you know, capabilities of this camera. And the lens like this, 50mm 1.4G, really gets everything out of 35mm negative, I think. It squeezes all the detail you would want out of it. In terms of if you're looking into getting something that's a hybrid between mechanical and digital film camera, Nikon F100 is definitely something you want to consider. If you want to see some cool stuff on cameras, I would suggest sticking about. Click subscribe, you know, because this space is going to be getting a lot of cool stuff on it, you know. And we're going to be looking at all these cameras here up on this shelf, you know. A lot, a lot of cameras. A lot, a lot of cameras. You don't want to miss that, do you? No.